Okay, people, good day. Hope everyone is well. So what I'm going to do today is talk a little bit about John Dewey's piece called Nature, Communication, and Meaning. And that's a chapter from his book called Experience in Nature. Now, Dewey did write quite a bit in his life. His experience in nature was known as his metaphysics, where he laid out what was known as experimentalism. He's sometimes in a line with pragmatism, but I do think that if you go and you dig around a little bit, you will find that experimentalism is actually the metaphysics that he had, which he believed that, you know, people needed to kind of roll up their sleeves, get involved in the world, make some changes and then see what happens and try to experiment in some way with society and social organizations. But he was he was also pointing out that there's a kind of experimentalism that comes from the human in that we're able to, rather than, you know, just learning by trial and error, we're able to engage in some forms of, I guess, learning informal instruction by way of abstract consideration through language and other forms of, of symbols and, and communication. So what I want to do is I'm going to go and give like tight readings of a good number of paragraphs in here, see if I can elucidate a little bit more of it, and then, you know, kind of go back and forth between the text uh, and some examples. I don't normally give this type of, of textual readings on my channel, but I thought it'd be interesting uh, just for this piece here. So let me start with, with the actual piece here. And so here's what, here's what Dewey says. Let me move that over a little bit. He says, of all, and this is, again, this is the chapter that's called Of Nature, Communication, and Meaning. Uh, this is also, this is a condensed chapter. So the book itself is, you know, fairly massive. And then the chapter is a good sized chapter. This is an, a series of excerpts from that chapter that was first published in the book called The Human Dialogue by Montague and Mateson. So again, it's, it's like nine pages. It's, it's very, very short. Okay, <clears throat> here's what he says. He says, of all affairs, communication is the most wonderful that things should be able to pass from the plane of external pushing and pulling to that of revealing themselves to man and thereby to themselves. And that the fruit of communication should be participation. Sharing is a wonder by the side of which transubstantiation pales. When communication occurs, all natural events are subject to reconsideration and revision. They are readapted to meet the requirements of conversation, whether it be public discourse or that preliminary discourse termed thinking. Events turn into objects, things with a meaning. They may be referred to when they do not exist and thus be operative among things distant in space and time through vicarious presence in a new medium. Brute efficiencies and inarticulate consummations as soon as they are um, hold on. Brute efficiencies and inarticulate consummations, as soon as they can be spoken of, are liberated from local and accidental contexts and are eager for naturalization in any non-insulated communicating part of the world. Events, when once they are named, lead an independent and double life. In addition to their original existence, they are subject to ideal experimentation. Their meanings may be infinitely combined and rearranged in imagination, and the outcome of this inner experimentation, which is thought, may issue forth an interaction with crude or raw events. Meanings having been deflected from the rapid and roaring stream of events into a calm and traversable canal, rejoin the main stream and color, temper, and compose its course. Where communication exists, things in acquiring meaning thereby acquire representatives, surrogates, signs, and implicates, which are infinitely more amenable to management, more permanent, and more accommodating than events in their first estate. Okay, wow, that's the opening paragraph of that chapter, right? Just so much going on there. Now, again, kind of go back and tease it out, right? When he says events turn into objects, things with a meaning. You want to think huge. I mean, he's talking about something that's so big, it's almost difficult to imagine how massive of what he is he's talking about. I mean, he's sort of saying all of reality, all of reality is this kind of eventing that's going on, different kinds of eventing. And human discourse has transformed those events into objects 
that can be thought about and that can be, I guess, dealt with in ways that in the actual, you know, unfolding of the events in their original state, they're just too unaccommodating, right? That they, they can't be adapted and revised and, and brought about for free play. And that's why, you know, when he starts, you know, he says of revealing themselves to man and thereby to themselves, he's sort of getting at the sense in which, you know, humans are a kind of, of an organism, but that organism is actually a prolonged eventing over its entire lifespan, right? The ontogeny of the organism shows that the organism isn't really a thing so much as an event. And of all of the world's events, we're one of the events, and now we're able to think about ourselves as a thing in relation to the world over there as another thing, which means that by way of discourse, we have been able to think about both ourselves and the world. And in that sense, we've not only had the events of the world, the all the different eventfulness, you know, the, the things, that, the, the seasons, all of the different uh, aspects of the world, right? of reality, we've been able to turn those into objects that we can think about, including ourselves, right? And then he says that the fruit of communication should be participation. Sharing is a wonder by the side of which transubstantiation fails. Now, again, if you know the term transubstantiation, this is a, a term that goes back to the Catholic tradition, refers to the transformation of the host into the Eucharist, that is the, the body and blood of Christ, right? The, the host and the wine. And I think, you know, if, if you do follow this, I mean, the, the Orthodox Catholic belief is that it actually is a transformation of, of, of one substance into another substance. And that's partly what Dewey's saying. He's saying that compared to that, communication is even more wonderful. It's more amazing in that it turned otherwise somewhat I guess for lack of a better word, dumb organisms into rational human beings. Now, let me see if I can further clarify that I want to go into that paragraph a little bit more and then I'm going to continue on. But before I go on to that, let me see if I can talk a little bit about what he's suggesting. And again, go, go back and look at that, that paragraph again, right? So he's, he's kind of doing a distinction between on one hand, what could be called existence and the other hand could be called essence. Now, when I say in existence, and when he uses the word exist, existence, he's talking about the world as endless eventing and events and of change. The fact that the world in its existence is just endless becoming. It's the world is the oldest it's ever been. You're the oldest you've ever been. No, now you're the oldest you've never been. So, so there's this kind of stuff. We have, you know, there are plants and trees that are growing. We have organisms being born, organisms dying. And there's a kind of brute efficiency of just our installment in the world where we can interact in our immediate now in certain ways. Uh, you can untie knots and you can, you know, remove certain brush from the, the path that you're walking through. And you do have a lot of different, again, these sort of engrossing immediacies in our inarticulate consummations. It's it's, it's the organism installed in that immediate environment and the various resources it has for kind of making things happen, for moving things along in an inarticulate way. Roughly, in the modern term, it would be perception, right? Perception is what gives us access to existence. It's what we can hear, touch, taste, uh, smell, right, and see, right? It, it's, it's all those things that come in through the senses. And, you know, to just try to give an example now, it's odd because I'm using words that now turn these into objects for contemplation, but without words, when we look out there in the, the changing endless variety that is the world, we see things like the dawn of spring, or you can watch a, a piece of fruit age, or you can watch a, a river sort of roar on and, and continue to flow. You can see various weather patterns, or even you know, as a simple act like wiping your brow. Now, that he wants to set in contrast to essences. Now, <clears throat> some of this will get tricky because there is a big distinction of how the ancients treated essences and how the moderns do, right? I think essences in the ancient world tend to be aligned with something like Platonic forms, right? These sort of pre-Darwinian notions of things 
outside and removed from the empiricals, outside and removed from existence. And they're like these kind of ideals that are regulative of the processes of becoming. So you find, again, objects or things that have a kind of permanence. It's sometimes aligned with being, right? With a capital B or sometimes aligned with what we call thought or universals. And again, as I say, these sort of timeless forms in the Platonic sense, I think for the ancients, again, these are recognized as somehow outside of our direct reality, but they're, they're shining their, their regulative and forming light onto the things in existence that allows those things to be what they are. Whereas I think in the moderns, the modern world, we, we're more likely to deal with essences in terms of concepts. So we think of those things that we're able to conceive of by the mind. And so this is sort of where Dewey's coming in at communication, right? That in some way, we see the world of change and flux that's going on over there. And then there's another sense in which we have the sort of mind. Now, whether mind is conceived supernaturally or inside the individual's head, we have some notion of things like thoughts or concepts. And I think what Dewey wants to say is that many people in the modern world, they're, they're stuck with like something like thoughts are somehow far removed from the world of eventfulness, the world that can be perceived. And it's either like thoughts are locked up in the head or they're in some sort of platonic heaven, but there is no natural commerce to get from one to the other. And Dewey wants to say, no, there, there actually is. There is communication. And that communication allows us to get from one thing to the other. Again, as I, as I said, right, the, the key line here is, right, Dewey says, when communication occurs, events turn into objects, things with a meaning, right? So, okay, here, now you can see this right now. Let me see if I can show you this, right? So if I, if I show you this right now and I say, what is this? You say it's a fist. We can all see the fist. Now I go like this. Okay, where did the fist go? Yeah, see... I call it a fist and it's, I can recognize that object, but that's really me turning an event into an object. And when I open it, I'm reminded of the fact that it wasn't really so much a thing as I'm conceptualizing this event as if it were a meaningful object, partly because I'm able to talk about it that way. You know, sort of like, where does your lap go when you stand up? Right. Again, your lap isn't really a thing, but we can, through communication and discourse, transform that that momentary event into a kind of thing we can talk about. Now, if I had this pen here in my hand, now notice the pen does seem to be an object, although if we bring the, the physicists in, they're going to say it's a swirling electron cloud and there's a lot that's happening at a subatomic level. But at any rate, we can see this pen. We can talk about it as a pen. And notice when I'm doing that, I'm taking this entire environment that I'm in and I'm separating the pen from my holding of the pen, from my body, from the larger environment. Again, each time I give a word, I'm separating off a kind of thing from this larger event. But notice here, you know, when Dewey says this line, uh, when he says, brute efficiencies and inarticulate consummations, as soon as they can be spoken of, are liberated from local and accidental context and are eager for naturalization in any non-insulated communicating part of the world. Events, when once they're named, lead an independent and double life. Yes. See, once they're named, I can now do different kinds of experimentation. So without any names, I can just like actually by trial and error, move the pen through space from one hand to another. But once I can talk about the pen, I can talk about the pen being like right now, I can say it just was in my left hand and I'm about to put it back over there. Should I put it in my left hand? Yeah, I think I will. Now I can say, well, it just was in my right hand. Maybe I should put it back into my right hand. That is, anything and everything can be extracted from its particular local and real context. And now in the world of thought, be experimented with, sort of played around for uh, various possible relations that we, could, that we could see there. Now, a different way to say all this is, you know, so imagine you're looking at, a, say, like a basketball you have like a basketball game and the people are, you got the five players there represented by the letters of the alphabet. Now the players are just there. And if you ever watch a sporting event, the sporting event in terms of existence, it's just a bunch of players running around. There's just eventfulness happening. But then once we're able to talk about those events, we can start to see 
repeatable events that can be reasoned about, thought about, and they give us some way to get from existence over to essence, and then from essence back over to existence. So for example, there, there are the, the players, and you can imagine something like uh, player A, right? Player A has the ball, and I the player A throws the ball to B, then B throws it to C, C throws it to D, and D throws it to E. Now, in that case, what we saw is something like, you know, like one, two, three, four. We had four acts of the same thing happened. It was called a, a pass, right? A pass. So even though the world itself is just this eventfulness, and the, again, one, it's a relationship from A to B, one's a B to C, and one's C to D and D to E, and yet we can say in some way that the same thing happened, that it was, it was a kind of past that went on there, right? And Notice here, when we're, when we're ability to do that, we're taking the events, turning it into objects, and you can't, you can't really reason or count what doesn't have, you can't reason about or count what doesn't have a boundary. And so the ability to extract out this concept of a pass as an object that occurs, we can then perform all kinds of statistics. We can say, look at how often A passes to B, or we might say, you know, we might, uh, you know, get in there, you know, the coach may come in and say something like, you know, we need to move people around. We need to make sure that people aren't doing what we had been doing. Let's get uh, some different kinds of arrangements over here. And then you have, okay, so let's, next time we take the ball, we're going to have A go over to D, then go to C, go to B, go to E, and then go back to D, right? And again, so in this sense, not only are we able to abstractly reason about and count this kind of ongoing event into discrete sub-events that are actually meaningful objects in their own regard, that is certain numbers of passes that either player has given to the other, but we're able to then take that drawing board and then inform how we get back to our, uh, to our life and existence. And that's that, that point, right? When Dewey's talking about this communication forms a natural bridge from existence to essence because it turns those events into objects, things with a meaning. Yeah, we can go from existence, this sort of immediate environment that we're in, and then extrapolate out those signs that allow us to think about uh, what's going on. And then once we're in that realm of like abstractly just thinking about the game, say on the sideline or abstractly thinking about something while we're not actually engaged in it, we can experiment by thought rather than by actual trial and error and then have that, ex that inner experimentation, which is thought sort of inform our movement through, uh, through existence. Now notice here, right, that you know, you, you might think of it this way, you know, like say you go somewhere and you have a really good lasagna meal, you eat a lasagna meal, and then you ask somebody, well, how did they make it? You know, what did you do? And then they tell you in good detail what it is they did in order to make the lasagna. See, when you taste in the lasagna and you're eating lasagna, this the particular lasagna in front of you, you're kind of in that world of existence. When you ask the person, how did you make it? And then they're telling you, and they use all the words. They say, well, I brought this kind of cheese. And I use this kind of temperature. And here's the order of arrangement that I did. Now, maybe you can remember it well. Maybe you write it down. In either case, the, the language allows you to then take that essence, that is the sort of lasagna in the abstract or the lasagna as nothing but recipe and go all the way back to creating a lasagna yourself, right? And now notice here, I have this, these top uh, examples. Dewey isn't that good, you know, he's really, really good at, at communication very broadly and getting us to think in the largest possible context. He's a little bit skinny on how literacy is related to the meta language that allows us to think about our thinking itself. You know, I think my most recent video, if people looked at that by uh, David Olson, you know, Olson is really good. He's, he's a little bit more critical of Dewey, I think unjustly. This is partly what's motivating this discussion right here. Uh, but I think that he is right that 
you know, there are ways in which we could take this example of existence and essence and really apply it just to the spoken word itself and how the spoken word has become what it is largely through literacy, which is, again, a different way of thinking about the speech events as objects. So if you think about the speech sounds simply perceived in the air, just, just perceived as sounds, maybe you're listening to a foreign tongue on radio, that's you experiencing the sounds just as the sounds. But as soon as you transform those sounds into the repeatable lexical items we know as words and you can hear the particular words out of the sounds that you're you're listening to at that point you're conceptualizing the sounds as words and you're dealing with with the essence that's there available um in the uh, in the speech sounds right again that we're able to hear not just the different sounds, like, you know, imagine nine different people all say the word guacamole, you know, they're going to have different rates, different intonations, different pitches, different accents, and all of those empirical differences are available there in the world. But what we can hear when we hear the same word being said is the kind of essence of the, the sounds in the sense it's the words that are those discrete meanings that then can be brought into free play with other words uh, as we think about things. Okay, so I'm going to go see if I can go back to the text now a little bit and, and advance this uh, a little further. So we, we had our first paragraph and now we're, we're going on. And it's what he says, right? So if you remember, he says, he, he ended that paragraph with where communication exists, things in acquiring meaning thereby acquire representatives, surrogates, signs and implicates, which are infinitely more amenable to management, more permanent, more accommodating than events in their first estate. And we tried to walk through that a little bit, right? He says, by this fashion, qualitative immediacies cease to be dumbly rapturous, a possession that is obsessive and incorporation that involves submergence, a condition found in sensations and passions, he says, they become capable of survey and contemplation and ideal or logical elaboration. When something can be said of qualities, they are purveyors of instruction, learning and teaching come into being, and there is no event which may not yield information. A directly enjoyed thing adds to itself meaning and enjoyment is thereby idealized even the dumb pang of an ache achieves a significant existence when it can be designated and descanted upon. It ceases to be merely oppressive and becomes important. It gains importance because it becomes representative. It has the dignity of an office. Okay, so he's saying, yeah, the, the submerged kind of evolved connection to the world uh, in, in sensations, in passions, even something like a toothache, now it's no longer simply the organism there in that immediacy, but instead it becomes a thing that's meaningful in its own right. That is, I can say I have a toothache and it kind of has like, you know, a dignity uh, of an office there. Um, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump ahead here. I know I and, and well, let me, let me, I guess I'm, I'm going to ease it. He says, he says, in view of these increments and transformations, it's not surprising that meanings under the name of forms and essences have often been hailed as modes of being above and beyond uh, spatial and temporal existence, invulnerable to, to vicissitude, nor that thought as their possession has been treated as a non-natural spiritual energy disjoined from all that is empirical. Yet there is a natural bridge that joins the gap between existence and essence, namely communication, language, discourse. Failure to acknowledge the presence and operation of natural interaction in the form of communication creates a gulf between existence and essence, and that gulf is factitious and gratuitous. So he's saying, look, you don't have to imagine these kind of essences that are far removed and outside of the empirical world, you need to see that it's communication which gives us this natural bridge. It allows us to get from the world in its eventful, quotes, first estate to that idealized world of thought where we can decontextualize items, again, from their immediate environment and, and think more about them abstractly. Again, experimenting with thought rather than by practical trial and error. 
he goes on then he talks a little bit about anthropology and he says that you know both empiricist and transcendentalist haven't dealt that much with language but admittedly he says that um the anthropologist philologist and psychologist have said the most that has been said about saying right now he goes on at the this bottom of this paragraph, after he's doing the stuff about language as vital to tools, and we want to admit that yes, language and tool making are vital to what we mean by the human condition. But Dewey's like, look, you know, don't over uh, play the role of tools. Language is the tool of tools. Language is all the way align, all the way along, sort of guiding the use of tools. It's the way we think about the application of tools in the abstract without actually having to, you know, hammer things out in the particular, right? Now, he says, upon the whole, this is at the bottom of that page, upon the whole, professed transcendentalists have been more aware than professed empiricists of the fact that language makes the difference between brute and man. The trouble is that they have lacked a naturalistic conception of its origin and status. Logos has been correctly identified with mind. Again, they're talking about the Greek. He's talking about the Greek term logos, right? And the term logo, the word logos in ancient Greek, it meant it meant word, it meant story, it meant order, it meant logic, it meant reason. It was this ability to think, but it was also like the orderliness of the cosmos, right? I mean, the, the Greeks, they didn't think that they had discovered the inward like thought inside the brain so much as they had discovered the orderliness of the cosmos that the language was just fortunately lining up with, right? He says again, logos had has been correctly identified with mind, but logos and hence mind, as he says, uh, he says, were conceived of supernaturally. Logic was thereby supposed to have its basis in what is beyond human conduct and relationships. And in consequence, the separation of the physical and the rational, the actual and the ideal received its traditional formulation, right? So he's, he's suggesting here, right, that people in the Western tradition, when, when the ancient Greeks discovered the logos, they took it to be something outside of existence rather than something that was a natural bridge out of communication or rather than being the product of discourse, they saw it to be something independent and wholly discovered. Now, he says, in protest against this view, empirical thinkers have rarely ventured in discussion of language beyond reference to some peculiarity of brain structure or to some psychic peculiarity such as tendency to outer expression of inner states. And notice he's throwing scare quotes out here. This is like the equivalent of rubber gloves and or volatile contents handle with care, right? He's, he's very critical of this outer inner stuff. Now look at, look at the precise language he busts out with here. And you want to hear it. He's given kind of tongue in cheek criticism of, of how people are thinking about language, kind of trivializing what it's doing. He says, he says, social interaction and institutions have been treated as products of a ready-made specific uh, physical or mental endowment of a self-sufficing individual wherein language acts as a mechanical go-between to convey observations and ideas that have prior and independent existence. Speech is thus regarded as a practical convenience, but not of fundamental intellectual significance. It consists of mere words, sounds that happen to be associated with perceptions, sentiments, and thoughts, which are complete prior to language. Language thus expresses thought as a pipe conducts water and with even less transforming function than is exhibited when a wine press expresses the juice of grapes. And again, he's making fun of this. It's sometimes called the conduit metaphor of communication or language. I mean, he's, he's sort of lampooning the way that people imagine that thought sediments are all there and all that you only need languages to convey it to other people. And he says, right, the office of signs in creating reflection, foresight, and recollection is passed by. Again, the office of signs in creating reflection, foresight, and recollection is passed by. In consequence, the occurrence of ideas becomes a mysterious parallel addition to physical occurrences with no community and no bridge from one to the other. So again, he's very critical here of people who trivialize the role of language, underestimate the degree to which our mental life is facilitated by the 
the transforming of those events into objects. Now, let's get very clear here, right? I want to get, we're going to have to get uh, kind of technical on some of this, right? Are there different processes going inside my brain? Do I have different uh, dynamic active processes that are going on there. Yeah, I think I do. And I don't think it's all just language. I think when I dream, I dream in images, maybe even in, in certain kinds of feelings, and that a thought or an intention seem to be somewhat different than a recollection, which seems to be different than an anticipation, which maybe seems to be different than something like a, a desire or a feeling. That is, I have a whole range of different aspects and dynamic processes that comprise mental life. And here's the question though, could you keep all of those different dynamics clear to yourself and orderly? And would it make sense to you without the language in order to identify those different essential dynamics? See, I think there, you know, is there some world beyond what we could say of it? Yeah, perhaps you just can't say what that world is. Is there, are there robust forms of mental processes independent of language? Well, yeah, maybe, but then why use the words mental processes? Why use the word thought? Why use the word idea? Why use the word memory? See, I think there are these things there, but our ability to transform all of those just kind of brute efficiencies, those inarticulate consummations into actual objects that we can talk about and think about requires their concretion in language. That is, again, we're not trying to deny the complexity of mental life. We're trying to suggest that language is part of the way that we can think about all of those processes, largely by turning them into objects, that is, uh, things with a meaning, right? And in this case, again, e each word typifies some sort of essential process that's going on there. Okay, so look at the next paragraph. That's what he says. <clears throat> It's safe to say that psychic events, such as are anything more than reactions of a creature susceptible to pain and diffuse comfort, have language for one of their conditions. It's altogether likely that the ideas which Hume found in constant flux whenever he looked within himself were a succession of words silently uttered. Now notice, primary to these words, there was, of course, a substratum of organic psychophysical actions, but what made the latter identifiable objects, events with a perceptible character, was their concretion in discourse. When the introspectionist thinks he has withdrawn into a wholly private realm of events, desperate in kind from other events made out of mental stuff, he is only turning his attention to his own soliloquy. And soliloquy is the product and reflex of converse with others, social communication, not an effect of soliloquy. If we had not talked with others and they with us, we should never talk to and with ourselves. Because of converse, social give and take, various organic attitudes become an assemblage of persons engaged in converse, confer conferring with one another, exchanging distinctive experiences, listening to one another, overhearing unwelcome remarks, accusing and excusing. Through speech, a person dramatically identifies himself with potential acts and deeds. He plays many roles, not in successive stages of life, but in a contemporaneously enacted drama, thus mind emerges. Okay, so first part of that paragraph, he's being very critical of the notion that there is this kind of mental organic stuff that is meaningfully thought about independent of the way that we turn it into those objects by way of language. Certainly there is something there, right? What he calls an organic psychophysical actions, but it's the way in which I'm able to talk to myself. And again, that's what, that's what he means by soliloquy, this kind of internal self-talk, which it articulates and specifies and delimits all of those processes that allows us to reason about it. And then he wants to say, look, it's not as if individuals have stuff on their mind and then they acquired language to express it to other people. There's some sense, I think we understand what that means, but he's saying more significantly, it's that as we've learned to talk with others, as they learn to talk with us and our, we've learned to express what others can, uh, can comprehend and we're able to comprehend what they can express. And in that give and take, 
we learn to talk to ourselves. And in doing so, we're able to identify with, again, possible actions, with, with potential deeds. We think about ourselves performing actions without actually having to perform them. Again, the trial and error is not there in the concrete once occurrent context of existence. No, it's abstractly that we're able to do it uh, in thought. And that's, you know, I can all day long identify and disidentify with possible deeds and again, think about myself accordingly. Now he says, um, let me see if I want to, what do I, what do I want to do here? Uh, I guess, I guess I'm, I mean, there, there are other other things here in this chapter that I would like to talk about, but I think I'm going to, I'm going to call that, that for now. Let me, uh, let me just go back here and see if I can share this, this screen one more time. So I think, you know, one way to review what we've been trying to say here, right, is that in some way, the what, what Dewey calls the moderns or the empiricist, and he's largely picking on Hume here, they have what he's claiming is a kind of overly subjective view. They begin with mental life, assume that mental life is self-sufficing and independent, and then language is just a kind of mechanical go-between, and it makes it seem as if it's it's peculiar brain states and sensory capacities. And then again, language is like a convenience ha happenstance, a kind of window dressing that's really only needed when you uh, want to convey your ideas to other people. The, the ancients or the Greek uh, position, which he, what Dewey calls the transcendentalists, they assume that forms or ideas, essences are somehow eternal and are outside of reality and that they're, they're regulative of those processes of becoming. And to that extent, Dewey thinks that they're overly objective. That is, I think Dewey says, look, there is a middle ground between this sort of extreme subjectivism and extreme objectivism, and it's to realize that communication is the natural bridge between existence and essence. Now, take something like beauty, and maybe I'll wrap up with, with beauty, right? When, when you take something like beauty, I think for, for the moderns under Dewey's criticism, it would be something like beauty's in the mind of the, uh, you know, it's in the eye of the beholder. It's in each person's mind and it's wholly subjective. What one person sees is beautiful. Another person doesn't see is beautiful. And there you have it. And again, we think of beauty as something just like locked up in the head and either is something is seen to be beautiful according to that person's standards or not. The ancients or the Greek view is something like, no, beauty is real. And there's like an absolute pure beauty form that's out there in some sort of, again, Plato's heaven, something like that. And it's making everything that is beautiful, beautiful, because beauty, beauty, the pure form is participating in those particular beautiful things in existence as if the beautiful is regulating and, you know, by processes of symmetry and other forms of of aesthetic appeals, it's registering this, this phenomena of beauty. And what Dewey's going to say is no, no to both of them. He's going to say, no, beauty is much more of a cultural phenomenon. It's a socio-historical articulation of certain values and of the way that certain peoples in their communication have come to understand certain things as beautiful or not, right? And now, I, I, again, I think Dewey's going to talk about, yeah, there, could there be elements of symmetry or elements of, you know, somewhat like aesthetic constants, perhaps, and yet we can find in some cultures things that people recognize as beautiful that don't really align with that. And so for Dewey, he would say, look, it's so obvious when you look at the variations of beauty across cultures, across time periods, uh, we can see that it's a register of those people's minds, but as those minds became what they were by way of various forms of communication. So, okay, people, I hope that's enough to, to get people thinking more about Dewey's nature, communication, and meaning. Go check that piece out. Wonderful uh, things to be learned there, and I uh, hope everyone is well. Okay, take care. Have a good day.